Okay, so we're going, oops, we're going to go ahead and start recording this. And that way, if for some reason some people couldn't make it this afternoon, or if you want to go back and look at something that we did, I will post this recording up on the SBA's uh, YouTube channel as well. So we will make this recording available. Uh, I know that not, you know, different people might be coming in here. Uh, I do know some of the parts that we use. Um, Adafruit's been having some, uh, uh, hasn't been able to keep everything in stock, uh, understandably, because with everything going on with the uh, pandemic and everything. Uh, so if for some reason you don't have parts, um, that's fine. Um, I'm I'm going to do some pauses um, if a person wants to either, you know, copy some of the code that we have or, uh, you know, for them to 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 work on something. Uh, but again, we also are recording this as well, too. So you can always go back and, and I'll also make sure that we share all of the slides and everything. So um, as far as that goes. Um, OK, so we've got quite a few people that are jumping in now. So that's good. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, we can maybe we'll may, wait uh, a couple more um, minutes here and then we'll go ahead and get uh, started. Um, Welcome to my kitchen. <laughs> um, we're doing this from here because, uh, well, as you'll see later, it allowed us to get a GPS lock uh, for, for uh, some of the stuff that we're, we're demonstrating. So uh, sorry, I don't have the prettiest background, um, but uh, uh, it will work for what we're doing for this workshop. So. All right, I think with that, I'm going to go ahead and share okay. I think the easiest thing is I'm going to go ahead and share my screen uh, with this so uh, so again, I'll try to take some pauses throughout this. Um, and if you have any questions, um, go ahead and use the Q and A. Uh, that'll probably be the easiest way. Uh, when we get towards the end, uh, I can go ahead and probably open up uh, microphones and stuff like that. But just so that we make sure we kind of get some through some of the material, um, I'm going to probably keep everyone muted uh, for that. So I think with that, we will go ahead and get started. It's about 3.05, so hopefully people that are going to be joining us are have joined us. Uh, and welcome to AHAC 2020 workshop. This is new, this is different. Um, this is the first time, uh, especially for myself, doing a virtual workshop, so please forgive me. Um, uh, hopefully this goes relatively smooth. Um, and we tried to test as much as we could beforehand. So I'm pretty optimistic that we will hopefully have very little um, problems. So uh, so for this workshop, uh, as we talked about a little bit on the web page as well too, we're gonna kind of walk you through a couple different things. Um, a lot of this is uh, stuff that we at Iowa State University have already been uh, utilizing. Uh, we've done these on uh, numerous flights as well too. Uh, we're going to kind of talk about some of the hardware first uh, that we have, uh, a little bit about CircuitPython, and then we'll talk uh, a little bit with LoRa uh, as well. So uh, a couple things. Uh, first of all, uh, again, I have uh, two of my other students that are here. Um, uh, both myself and Matthew Pleva will be presenting. Austin Trask, uh, who um, was the previous project manager for our high altitude. A ballooning project um, and is actually still working um, in my lab uh, is also here to help answer any questions as well. Um, my name is Matthew Nelson again. Uh, I'm faculty at Iowa State University in the Aerospace Engineering Department. Uh, I'm the uh, director for the Make the Innovate program uh, and also the assistant director for Iowa Space Grant Consortium. And uh, most of my background is actually in electrical and computer engineering uh, embedded systems and human-computer interaction uh, for that. 
Uh, Matthew Pleva uh, uh, is a recent grad from our aerospace engineering uh, department. Um, and uh, he is now actually working on his master's in human computer interaction. Uh, he is also working uh, full time for Collins Aerospace as well. And uh, Matt, especially when he was working on his uh, bachelor's in aerospace engineering, has done quite a bit of programming. He's helped me out quite a bit, uh, both on some of the classes that I've taught and, of course, with a lot of the stuff that we do um, with Habit as well. Uh, before I move on, I know Rick had asked a question about the slides. Yes, I will post a copy of all these slides uh, uh, up as well too. We have a GitHub repository where we're going to keep all of the code uh, and any other kind of pertinent information, and I will also include a PDF version of the slides as well. Um, so yes, we will make those available. Okay, so this is just kind of an overview of what we'll be uh, tackling this afternoon. Uh, so the first thing is I've got some slides, and I'll, I'm going to kind of walk everyone through a, a hardware overview. Uh, some of the hardware that we're looking at uh, using, especially in this workshop, and why we're using some of that. Uh, then I'll also kind of do an overview with CircuitPython. Um, if you're not familiar with CircuitPython, then this will kind of get you up to speed about what that is, why we use it, um, what are some of the limitations that it has. Uh, then from here on out, we'll probably be doing a lot of switching back and forth between uh, slides and, and, of course, showing you some. Uh, actual uh, code. And uh, we'll do kind of a hello world. Uh, then I'll kind of walk you through a little bit of a, of a demonstration with how to interface with the GPS module, uh, then the low raw module. Uh, then I'm going to have Matthew Pleva kind of take over from there. And we're going to kind of show how we've been using these and how we're actually um, capturing the data. And we'll actually do some transmission of data in real time. Uh, and uh, then we'll kind of kind of show you how we kind of display all of the information with the ground station setup that we have. And then just to wrap things up, I'll talk a little bit more about some other things that you could potentially do. And then, of course, we'll have Q&A um, at the end of this. All right. So a little bit about the hardware um, that we're going to be using within the workshop. And again, if you don't have all this hardware, uh, don't worry. Um, and, and for CircuitPython, potentially you can use other hardware as well too, but we're going to focus primarily on the featherboards. And we'll talk a little bit about why that is uh, as well. Uh, so the first board that I kind of want to talk about is the Adafruit Feather M4. Uh, this is a 32-bit Cortex-M4 processor, and it's a pretty capable little board. Um, this board operates at 120 megahertz, uh, has 500, uh, 512 kilobytes of flash memory uh, that's on the chip, um, which we'll talk more about additional memory later. Uh, it's 192 kilobytes of RAM. It supports some floating point and also digital signal processing instructions as well. And so a lot of us that have been doing embedded systems uh, for a long time, we've come a long ways from the earlier 8-bit and even 16-bit microcontrollers that we used to have to now these really much more powerful and capable 32-bit um, uh, running a, you know, an ARM Cortex core uh, in them as well too. So, uh, this little board uh, you can pick up at Adafruit. By the way, we're not being endorsed or, or paid for by Adafruit. You'll hear me talk about Adafruit quite a bit. Um, it's just because they've done actually a lot of work, especially with CircuitPython and these boards. Uh, again, there are other boards you could potentially use CircuitPython uh, on as well. But just to keep things kind of simple, we, we're going to focus on, on these boards. Uh, and again, there's there's actually quite a bit of capabilities within these. Um, in addition to running at a pretty decent clock speed and having a lot of resources available, uh, there's a lot of GPIO pins that are available on these. Uh, we have a true digital to analog uh, converter. Uh, so we can actually do an analog output. Uh, the M4 supports that on both A0 and A1 pins, which means that 
If you want to actually spit out some audio, you can even do that um, in stereo. Uh, we have a 12-bit uh, analog to digital um, uh, converter uh, that's on six of our analog pins. Uh, like most microcontrollers, this does support, you know, the the standard serial SPI, I squared C um, uh, serial protocols as well. Uh, so when it comes to interfacing with a large variety of sensors, uh, hardware-wise, this board supports just about any kind of sensor that is uh, uses those protocols. Uh, but by the way, keep in mind. Uh, this board is a 3.3 volt board, so if you do interface any sensor, just make sure that the logic levels on that are also 3.3 volts. Um, we have pulse width modulation output as well, too. We have 16 of those. Uh, that's very useful if you're wanting to control a servo. Uh, you can also use it for uh, LEDs or maybe a motor controller. Uh, we have an I squared S. Uh, this is actually used for uh, audio streams. Uh, that can be supported with that. And we actually even have 8-bit of parallel lines that can be utilized for camera or video applications as well. Uh, so again, this tiny little board um, can do quite a bit um, with that. And, and this is on the, the M4. One of the other things that we'll kind of talk about as well is you'll hear us refer to some of the boards that are the uh, Feather Express boards. Uh, so Adafruit has a variety of, of different Feather boards, and there are some boards that will be labeled as you know, Feather M4 Express. Uh, so what's the difference between that and a non-Express board? Well, the Express boards were specifically designed uh, for CircuitPython. Uh, and one of the biggest things, and we'll, we'll talk about this in a little bit when we talk about CircuitPython, uh, is that CircuitPython does take up a lot of storage space. So they have designed these boards to have an additional two megabytes of flash storage that's uh, soldered onto the boards. Um, and those are accessible then um, uh, through CircuitPython and, and even through the USB port. Um, so again, uh, because of both the Python code, but more importantly, to store your code, any support files that you might need for that, and some of the libraries, which we'll talk about as well, uh, those take up a, a decent amount of storage space. You can run CircuitPython on a non-Express board. Most of the boards, as long as they say they support CircuitPython, will run CircuitPython. The issue becomes that oftentimes you have less memory to work with, and so you may only be able to add a couple libraries, or you're probably not going to do anything with having kind of any kind of multimedia. Um, there are some versions of these boards, by the way, that even have like a um, display on them. Uh, or if you wanted to, uh, like the M4, you know, play like a, a WAV file or something like that. Uh, again, you would need to have that storage space to contain that. Uh, so the two megabytes helps quite a bit, allows you to definitely store most of the libraries that you would probably ever use in, in your code. Uh, it also gives you a little bit of you know, room for additional multimedia files as well. Um, if you are wanting to use the M0 board, uh, that's perfectly fine, and especially a lot of the stuff that we do, um, especially with the example that we're going to walk through today with this workshop, uh, the M0 would work just perfectly fine. Uh, it's very similar. It's a similar type of 32-bit uh, ARM Cortex core, um, slightly different version. It uh, does run at a lower clock speed, so this runs at 48 megahertz. However, it also supports your usual serial I squared C uh, and SPI uh, bus with that. Uh, also has pulse width modulation output and a 12-bit uh, analog input. Uh, it does have a digital analog output. Um, there's only one of those. It's a 10-bit um, instead of a 12-bit bit for that. If you're just going to do like what we're going to walk through today, where you're just going to build like a high altitude balloon tracker. An M0 would be perfectly fine. Uh, if you wanted to interface with maybe a variety of other sensors or have some other things that you want to interface with uh, that might be a little bit more memory intensive or processing intensive, uh, that's where the M4 comes into play. It, it can probably handle that a little bit better 
uh, than what the M0 could. But both boards are fine. Um, when you look at other types of circuit Python, or we'll, you know, sometimes it gets, uh, there's also a version called MicroPython as well too. Um, as long as those boards support that in, in general, you're, you're usually good to go with talking and interfacing with most hardware that's out there. Um, and most of them are usually built off of the M0 or the M4 Cortex. Um, so you'll probably see that in, in other types of boards as well, too. They tend to right now build off of um, those two uh, chipsets. So those are probably one of the more uh, popular ones. There are some hardware that will run on the ESP chipsets uh, as well, too, which also gives you access to some built-in Wi-Fi. Um, there's also a few that will run off of... Um, uh, can't think of it now, uh, but it's one of the Bluetooth modules that also has a built-in Cortex um, processor in there as well. So, uh, so again, uh, we're we're going to demonstrate with the M4 just because it's what we're kind of used to, and we had some of these. But if if you can't find the M4 for some reason and you got an M0, you you would be fine. Um, one of the reasons why we like these boards uh, is how the boards handle power. Um, and with high altitude ballooning, sometimes power, especially if you're going to do something that is going to be a long duration flight, maybe a floater or something like that, uh, then power becomes even a little bit more critical. Uh, the uh, feather boards uh, are nice because they can actually, they have two uh, power input. Uh, they can run off of USB. Uh, so when you plug in the USB cable, it will power immediately up, uh, or they can run off of a lithium ion battery. And it is intelligent enough to go ahead and switch between uh, whichever power supply is hooked up to it. So for example, you can have a battery hooked up to it, you can have the USB hooked up to it, and if you unplug the USB, it will immediately switch over to the lithium ion battery and your code should continue to run just normal. In addition, these boards also do have built-in charging capabilities as well too. So when it's plugged in, when you have a battery plugged in and when you have the USB plugged in, that will also charge the lithium ion battery. So you can use these to have something that would be, if you're feeding in you know, your five volts into the USB, uh, that can go ahead and trigger to have the lithium ion battery charging as well. Now, it's not a super duper charger. Um, the charging rate is limited to 100 milliamps. Uh, if it's a relatively small battery pack, like the 500 milliamp hour that's there, that's probably not so bad. But if you're flying with a larger capacity, like 1,000 or 2,000, sure, it would take a long time for it to charge uh, that battery up uh, for that. Uh, in addition to that, the feather boards also have a built-in 3.3 volt regulator. Um, the regulator, I believe, is actually rated to about 750 milliamps. Uh, Adafruit officially says there's about 500 milliamps of reserve power uh, that's, that would be available for hooking up, again, your sensors, other types of items that you may want to have power from there. And as we'll talk about here next, uh, when you do, like if you're doing stacking or anything like that, um, that power is made available through that stack connection. So you can, uh, anything else that plugs into there can tap into that 3.3 volt um, as well. In addition, the feather boards also have an enable pin. And so you can actually use that enable pin to uh, turn on and off uh, the board uh, as well. So if, again, if you're putting this into a payload and you want to have some sort of an external switch or something to turn things on or off, you can utilize that enable pin on there to do that. So again, it's got some really good robust features when it comes to uh, managing the power system on there. And that's one of the reasons why we like the feather boards for that. Again, Adafruit and other companies do make some other types of boards, but not a lot of them have some of the robust power management features that you have with this board. So Adafruit has what they call feather wings. Uh, these are additional boards that can be added. There's a couple of different ways that you can do this. Um, it can be stackable. So you can have multiple boards stack up, uh, kind of like an Arduino, where you can have shields and you can also stack the shields if you have the right headers for those. 
Uh, they also sell both a what they call a doubler and a tripler option. So the picture in the upper right hand corner that I have there is a picture of their tripler. And you'll also see that in um, when I if I switch the feed over to the uh, little demo board that I have set up, I'm using that tripler uh, for this as well, too. And again, all these do is it just ensures that all the pins are, are mapped accordingly uh, from there. And as you can see, with the doubler and the triplers too, they also give you a little bit of prototyping space um, on the bottom there. So that's also kind of useful um, to have too, if you're trying to add like maybe a different um, uh, sensor uh, to that. Um, you can design your own feather wing if you want. Uh, I've done it a couple times. Um, a, again, the nice thing with Adafruit is they do have pretty much everything open source. Uh, you can download schematics, you can download um, you know, what they've used in their systems. You can look at their existing feather wings that they have uh, for that. They do have a decent amount of feather wings that are made available as well. Uh, so we'll look, of course, at two of them today. So we'll look at the GPS uh, feather wing and also the LoRa uh, feather wing. And the nice thing with that is, of course, then everything soldered up, ready to go. You solder in the headers, you plug it in, and it, it works from there. Um, Adafruit has a few others. Uh, there's another type of sensor that I'll talk about at the towards the end of the workshop that you could potentially use. Uh, the only thing I don't like is that it, they don't have a lot of sensors. So there is not like a good feather wing that has um, temp humidity pressure, for example. Um, maybe I should make one someday. <laughs> uh, but um, so that's the only drawback um, with the current offering that they have. Um, but there are other types of boards that you can use, especially if you're uh, like they have some for servos, they have some for measuring current, they have, you know, some that have displays on them. Uh, so yeah, there, there is a good amount of feather wings that are out there. There's also a few other companies uh, that have made some um, compatible feather wings as well. So again, it's, it's kind of like the Arduino where you kind of have the standard um, and a few other companies have also said, okay, sure, we'll make a, a feather wing for that as well. Um, so this really helps in expanding what you can do with the board. Um, the Feather M0s and M4s don't have a whole lot on the board themselves. They primarily have um, uh, a NeoPixel uh, and basically the processor. And, and then the Express boards, of course, have that additional two megs of memory that's soldered on. Uh, otherwise, everything else is being taken up by um, the charging circuit and, and uh, other support circuitry for that. Um, uh, they also have the, the picture, by the way, in the, the bottom right there, that is uh, one of their data logger. Uh, so this one uh, has a, um, a SD card attachment uh, that you can use with that as, uh, for doing any kind of data logging uh, through uh, that all goes to the SBI bus for that. Okay, so I'm going to kind of just stop sharing for a quick second here, maybe. And just make sure that I haven't missed any uh, questions or anything. OK, yeah, so Bill Brown asked, uh, current drain difference between the M0 and the M4. Um, from the data sheet, there's not much of a difference. Uh, it, obviously, the M4 does draw a little bit more power from it. It's running at a higher clock speed. Um, I think it's, uh, I, I hate to say something and then find out I'm wrong. I want to say it's like maybe only like 10 or 15 milliamps difference between the two. Um, but as one of my students put in there as well too, the um, generally we've run these M4s in uh, flights, uh, and yeah, I think we've been running either a thousand or two thousand milliamp hour battery, and we have not definitely drained that. And that's uh, that's not only running the M4, that's also running the M4, the GPS, and the low rod transmitter as well. 
14. Okay. Hey, I was I was close. I'm going to adjust my window here a little bit. There we go. Uh, James is asking how many attendees. Actually, we have 14 right now um, that I see that we have, and then, of course, the three panelists. So, Oh, and that's what, sorry. This is this is the issue I was having. I, my my Q&A screen was a little bit squashed, so I saw the 14 I thought Matt was asking or and responding to that. I see now that's responding to uh, James's question, so, okay. All right. Um, this worked earlier. All right. Good. That worked. Um, so, just to kind of before we get into it uh, again. Um, we have, uh, this is the tripler that I was talking about. Um, and here's the low raw module, which we'll talk more about here in just a little bit. There's the GPS module and there's the M4. So this is actually hooked up and running. So again, this is using the tripler board um, and that tripler board allows us to just plug in these components. So I think I can probably, if you wanna see kind of a, a side uh view with it um you can kind of see that so sorry it's, i don't have my focus set real good for that so yeah that's that's what that board uh does for us so okay so uh let me make sure that there's no other questions, and if not, then we will move on. Okay. All right, so CircuitPython. Um, what is it? Why are we using it? Why would we want to use it? Uh, and I'm going to assume that no one has done much with CircuitPython uh, for this workshop. So uh, if you have, great. Um, this will probably be more of a recap uh, for you. Um, and if you haven't, then yeah, hopefully this kind of helps um, with some of that. So first of all, let's talk about Python and what Python is. Um, Python is generally considered to be an interpretive language. There's a couple of different schools of thought. Um, technically, it gets kind of also compiled when it, when it you know, gets sent to the processor. Um, but in any case with Python, um, Python is a language that has been growing quite a bit in popularity. Um, it's a relatively easy to use programming language, which, which is why it's gained quite a bit in popularity. And it's a pretty powerful uh, programming language. And Python has gained a lot of popularity because it is open source. Um, it's freely available. Anybody can download Python. Um, and uh, it has a large set of libraries that can be used with it. And these libraries can tackle from routine tasks to large data sets, um, uh, graphing, you know, everything. Um, pretty much, <laughs> there's. I, I should have put it on on this slide. There's an XKCD uh, that I use when I um, uh, teach this to to my freshman students. That someone's flying, and uh, how are you doing that? And they're like, oh, it's because of Python. Um, so it, it's a pretty common language that we see. Uh, if you probably go and search for, you know, what languages are the most popular, uh, Python's usually in the top, probably two or three spots for that. Um, and one of the things is that with with Python, we um, because of the nature of how Python works, because you need to kind of have that interpreter or sort of engine that has to do some of the translation for you. 
using Python on embedded systems was always kind of, well, especially probably about 10 years ago, was kind of a pipe dream. Uh, it wasn't something that we, um, you know, would think that we would get to the point. Uh, what's changed, of course, is that um, the microcontrollers that we have, have gotten so powerful that it's become more feasible for us to actually use uh, Python on there. Um, so what is CircuitPython specifically? So CircuitPython uh, is, is Adafruit's fork of uh, MicroPython. So MicroPython was developed first. Um, it was the first attempt at trying to port and using Python in embedded type of systems, um, uh, especially with like the M0 and the uh, ESP uh, processors that were out there. And it's, uh, CircuitPython has kind of expanded beyond that. It's something that Adafruit um, supports. They've been doing a lot of active development uh, with that. And uh, through that, it's, it's, it's expanded quite a bit with the amount of libraries and even some of the capabilities uh, that they can do. Uh, at the core, however, what, what attracts people to CircuitPython is the fact that it is Python. So if you've already programmed in Python, then this kind of helps lower the barrier a little bit where we can now um, do programming in an embedded world in a language that maybe a lot more people are already familiar with. Um, and because Python is a little bit more forgiving on how it handles a few things, like with data types and stuff like that, it tends to be a little bit more accessible uh, to people than maybe programming something in C. You know, I think a lot of people are probably used to Arduinos. Uh, Arduinos, of course, use C or C++. Uh, and if you're, you know, C and C++ can sometimes not be as forgiving. Um, you have to make sure you declare your variables correctly and, and everything from there. Um, where Python's a little bit more forgiving on some of that stuff. And so some people prefer Python uh, for that. Um, and Python's a great tool for rapid prototyping and design. Uh, it, it does work really quickly. Um, and so, you know, with Python, you can very quickly kind of set up an environment and, and then run it from there. And that's another reason why people really like uh, Python, uh, because it's, it allows for that kind of rapid prototyping and design um, with that. Just in case, I'm not sure if other people are seeing that or not. Uh, so again, it's a very common programming language. Uh, it is taught um, in both uh, K through 12 and of course, higher education. So I mentioned here at Iowa State University, we actually uh, teach our students Python uh, in their freshman course. Uh, we actually have been incorporating some stuff with CircuitPython even into that um, uh, freshman course as well too, uh, just so that they get a little bit of experience with some hardware uh, for that. Uh, it's simple to use. Uh, unlike uh, C, uh, it doesn't need a, a compiler per se. Uh, everything runs on the chip. And we'll, when we get into some of the demos, we'll kind of show that. Uh, so you don't need to have like an IDE or anything fancy like that. Technically, any kind of text editor will work. Um, now, there's one that we're going to use just because it has a few other features um, with it, uh, which we'll kind of demonstrate. But uh, it's it's very easy to use. Uh, the code is just stored as text files, uh, and uh, it gets interpreted um, on the chip itself. Uh, and CircuitPython has a, a little bit of an advantage over uh, like Arduino in terms of kind of accessing uh, that two megabytes of flash storage that's on there. So when you plug in like an M0 or M4, um, and if it's running CircuitPython, it gets mounted as a mass storage device. Uh, so you can just drag and drop whatever files that you want uh, into there to program it. For example, if you had a code, a Python code, CircuitPython code that you wanted to move over there, you don't have to compile or anything. You just drag and drop that code over there, make sure it's um, called code.py, um, and the board will just start running that code uh, with no other intervention um, from you. 
again, this is one of the reasons why sometimes when you're working with some projects that might use multimedia files, such as image files or uh, audio files, uh, you know, Python can actually read a lot of those different formats um, and then play them back. Um, that's not as a, easy to do in C. Um, it, it can be done. And by the way, even with the express boards, um, the uh, Arduino, you, you can also program, I should probably back up here. You can program the M0s and the M4s, even the express boards in Arduino as well. You don't have to use CircuitPython. In fact, it's really easy to switch back and forth uh, between both of them. Um, all you need to do is usually just put it back into bootloader mode uh, to install CircuitPython. And for Arduino, once it's hooked up, if you compile and have it send uh, the code uh, to the board, it will immediately switch it over to basically Arduino mode uh, for that. So again, you can um, you can use or you can't use both at the same time, but you can go back and forth between the two. Uh, and Arduino and C uh, can access that memory, but again, it's just it's a little bit more clunky to do that uh, than how CircuitPython treats it because CircuitPython just treats it like a mass storage device uh, for it, so. Okay, so I've talked a lot about all the great things about CircuitPython and how wonderful it is and all that good stuff. Um, why wouldn't we use CircuitPython? Well, there are some legitimate limitations that we have with CircuitPython, and there are a few things that um, we should know about when we're working with uh, CircuitPython, and, and some of these will come up later when we talk about things with the code as well. It does use extra resources. Um, so, you know, again, some of that processing power is going to that in interpreter that we have running on the chip. Uh, I talked about earlier about memory is an issue and, and both RAM and storage is, is an issue. So uh, RAM why? So uh, the CircuitPython that we have on there does do garbage collection. It will try to manage the memory as best as it can. Uh, they have actually made quite a bit of improvements in, in recent uh, versions to tackle things such as fragmentation in the memory as well. And so it has gotten better, but it's still a limited amount of RAM. And just because of some of the built-in nature of how Python runs, uh, we, we still oftentimes have some fragmentation uh, that happens with that memory as well. Uh, so there is a limit to how much code uh, that you can run. Uh, and that, of course, includes your libraries. Uh, there are some things that we can do. So uh, most of the libraries that you'll download will be sort of, you know, pre-compiled. They'll be set up as MPY files. Uh, and that helps to reduce um, some of the, the memory overhead with some of the memory. Um, but the other thing is, you know, sometimes you may have to actually just limit, you know, how much you're doing with that code because you may run into out of memory errors. And I personally have run into that before um, on a couple of different projects. So it's again, it's something you need to kind of be aware of. Again, for a lot of the stuff like what we're doing today in this workshop, uh, it's typically not a problem. If you're really starting to get into some pretty complicated stuff, you're dealing with maybe uh, moving a lot of data back and forth, or um, you're trying to do quite a, a lot, uh, and so you have multiple things that are being uh, run on there, and that could be, you know, causing some errors with that. And then I mentioned the storage memory issue as well to you. So again, uh, in order to utilize some of those libraries, those need to be copied over um, to the board, and that will, of course, take up that space. Um, it's not great for mission critical um, type of uh, applications. Uh, the biggest reason is that we don't have access to interrupts. Um, so the M0 and the M4 processors, of course, do support interrupts. Uh, if you were to run uh, a similar type of project with Arduino with C, yes, you would have access to those interrupts. But CircuitPython right now does not have access to those uh, interrupts. So there is no mechanism for handling that. Uh, so that is where sometimes, again, if you've got something that you need to have happen right on the spot, um, then CircuitPython may not be a good uh, application uh, to use for that. Um, that having said that, 
Uh, it, it does handle most things pretty well, you know, even though that some hardware like NeoPixels that will show and a few other things do have some pretty tight uh, timing requirements uh, that it, it handles pretty well. But again, if you've got something where uh, you're working on some code and you've got something that will will stop the execution temporarily or kind of blocks your CPU, uh, you don't have much recourse because you don't have any way to interrupt. Um, that processor. Um, so just keep that in mind. Uh, and then handling and floating point numbers, uh, we'll talk about this with some of the GPS uh, items as well too. Uh, so we do have uh, the, the M4s especially will handle floating point numbers usually without any problems. But again, a limitation with CircuitPython is that uh, we have a little bit of more um, restricted number of decimal digits that we can handle. So uh, again, as we look at some of the stuff with the GPS, um, that gets a little bit more critical for that. Okay, so how do we get started with CircuitPython? Um, so the first thing I'm going to show you guys is uh, we'll look at where we can go to download CircuitPython. Um, I'll also kind of show you guys putting the board into the bootloader mode. Uh, and then we'll look into, you know, it's pretty simple actually. Once you download the image file, um, it's just pretty much as simple as going ahead and dragging that file over uh, and then allowing the board to reset and then it'll be running um, CircuitPython uh, from there. So, let me exit out. Okay, I'll maximize this here. All right, so this is circuitpython.org. Uh, this is the website uh, that you can go to. And this website actually makes it really easy to find uh, the correct CircuitPython that you need for your board uh, and also all of the libraries. Uh, so if we click here on downloads, You can see, so these are all the various types of hardware boards that are supported by CircuitPython currently. Um, so I'll just kind of scroll down. You can see there are quite a few boards. And again, most of these are by um, Adafruit, but there are a few other made by like um, Arduino and a few other manufacturers as well. So these are all the various boards. And, and I mentioned earlier, you know, you'll notice that some of these have like displays on them. Um, so again, that's where having that extra memory comes into um, play. So I'm going to uh, have the Feather M4 Express board. That's the board that I'm working with for this workshop. And if I click on that, you can see there's two versions here. So version 5.3.1, uh, as of today, is the current stable release. And generally, you want to work with the stable version. Um, uh, unless there's a feature that's in the bleeding edge version that you really, really need, uh, you could also go with that. So they are currently in active development with version 6.0 uh, for CircuitPython. Looks like they're in alpha uh, version right now. Um, but we're going to go ahead and stick with the 5.31 uh, stable. If I click here, this will download uh, a file uh, for me. Now, of course, I've already downloaded this file. Uh, and it is right here. So this is the Adafruit CircuitPython Feather M4 Express uh, UF2 file. Okay. Now, what I'll go ahead and show you is <clears throat> two things. Uh, to do, do, do. Oh, do I have to stop sharing? I think so. Okay, so hopefully everyone can see that. Um, 
So I, I wanted to switch to this viewpoint so that I could show you what I'm going to be actually doing. So we need to go ahead and put uh, the device into that sort of bootloader mode. Um, in order to do that, what we can do is there is a reset button that is on here. And I know this isn't the easiest to see. I'll see if I can um, refocus this. All right. So by that USB cable, you can see there's this reset button that's right there. So what we're going to do is we're going to press that reset button twice. And I, I pressed it pretty quickly between the two. And you'll notice that as soon as I did that, uh, the NeoPixel that's on the side here is now red. Refocus that. Okay. All right. So let me go back and share my screen. And so now, uh, go back, uh, see what Scott wanted to. Uh, maybe it. Me, give me a second here. Well, of course, things don't want to work the first time, even though it worked earlier. Okay, I think this might work um, now. So I'm going to. There we go. Okay, so uh, what we want to see is we want to see this um, feather boot uh, drive that pops up. Uh, once we have that feather boot drive that's popped up, uh, we can go over to our downloads. And again, let me just get this kind of out of my way. Uh, we can go ahead and just copy this over just like you would like any other file. And that will go ahead and copy that most recent version um, of that. The board will then go and reboot like it just did. Uh, and then you will have CircuitPython running um, on, this, on this board. Now, if the board was a brand new board. You probably won't have some of the files that I have on there right now. Generally, if it's a clean board, it would have the um, uh, just the uh, uh, boot out uh, that's on there. But uh, by the way, if you upgrade, like if you decide that you want to go ahead and move to a newer version of CircuitPython, again, you can do that. Generally, it won't wipe out any of the files that you have on here. Uh, so that's usually fairly safe to do so. But again, the caveat always being you should always, you know, um, add some, uh, uh, you should always back up your code uh, just to make sure. Uh, so, okay. Now, the other thing that we can take a look at is with libraries. So again, Adafruit has um, a number of libraries that it has to support uh, a, a large amount of hardware. Most of it, again, being Adafruit's hardware. Um, there are some that will support some other boards as well, too. 
And what they have done is they have created uh, what they call a, a Circuit Python library bundle. Okay. So this is a zip file. You would download uh, the bundle that would be relevant to the major code revision of CircuitPython that you're running. So in our case, we're running version 5.x. Uh, so we would, again, we would just go ahead and we would download that. Now, again, I've already downloaded this file and I've actually already unzipped it as well because it takes a little bit of time to unzip because uh, there's a lot of files in there. But if we take a look at this, so this is what's in that library file. Um, the lib folder contains all the various libraries um, that is currently in this bundle. And then what's also very useful as well is they also have a lot of example code. Uh, so you can go into examples here and they have a, a lot of example code for, uh, you know, from basic IO to some of the examples with um, some of the other devices that they have. So there's some Bluetooth, um, Circuit Playground. Um, so any kind of uh, examples that you want to uh, take a look at are also found in that examples folder. Now, while I've got my screen up, um, what I'm going to also show you. So, if it's not there already, what you want to do for the li for the for the libraries that you have is you want to create a folder here called lib lib. Uh, in that folder, then you can go ahead and throw in whatever kind of library files uh, that you want uh, to use. Um, Usually dragging in the entire lib file may or may not fit, depending on what else that you have. Um, I think this is around 1.6 megs now. Um, so if you have a two megs, it, it will fill that up pretty quick and won't give you a lot of wiggle room. Uh, typically what I do and what I think is usually best is to, you know, drag over the libraries that you're going to use. Um, so the ones that we are using today, um, the Adafruit bus device, so I'll also show you where that is under lib. Uh, so this is in that folder that you would unzip. Uh, so the bus device, uh, this is often used by a lot of other libraries. Uh, this helps to support things like your I squared C, your spy bus, um, and provides the functionality uh, for accessing that hardware. Um, we'll talk about uh, the Adafruit GPS um, and that library. Uh, and then this is the library for the LoRa radios uh, that we can use. And then because I'm going to do a demo with the NeoPixel, I also included the uh, NeoPixel. Um, so again, you can see over here, there's, um, uh, if you scroll down, you'll find, so some of these are in a folder, and then some of these are just a single single file. Um, most of the ones for like sensors are usually just a single Python file that we have for that. So uh, usually you can find it in here and almost all of them will start with Adafruit and then usually the, the uh, part um, model number uh, for it. So if we go here and we look, we can scroll down, they have Adafruit and then it is the RFM 9X. And, and by the way, we're for our low ROS, we're using the 9x chipsets, the 95s, and we're not using the the 69 chipsets for that. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing and take a little bit of a break. Um, mostly because I partly need to <laughs> rest my throat. Um. And I'm also looking at uh, some of the, the questions that you guys have. So if you guys want to ask any questions now, that's fine. Um, I'm just going to take a, <clears throat> I'm going to mute and um, just take a little bit of a quick break here. Um, and then we'll, we'll get started some more. Um, 
Jesus, yes, we will be talking more on the specifications with the LoRa on the GPS feather unit. So, um, yep. Um, question uh, on the LoRa radio, um, at what altitudes have we tested those at? Uh, we've tested those up to, and Matt or Austin, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we've hit at least 90,000 feet now with those. Is that correct? I think we did 112. 112. Okay. I think I think we had those running when we did that 112 run year or two ago. Okay. Okay. And if I remember right too, I mean, I think we've tested these out at least over open sky. What I think we figured at one time probably a good 20 miles out. For range on these? Yeah. Oh, we've done significantly more than that. Okay. We've we've done probably 100, 100 miles. All right. Yeah. Um, Randy's asking, can you list the libraries that you're using? Yes, I can. Um, let me see if I can actually uh, throw those into the Q&A real quick. Um, just in case you missed that. Uh, Uh, hmm. And then we have uh, we'll use Adafruit. Oh, yeah, and then that one. Yes. And we'll talk more about the um uh the 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 GPS one. Um there is a um, slight issue with that that we discovered actually uh, with it. So, okay, let me change that. Um, what antennas are you using lower radio module? Can you include a link to that part on the website? Um, yeah, so I, I can, um, but truth be told, um, there's a lot of variables when it comes to the antenna part. Um, uh, the, the antennas that we have set up is, so you can see actually right now, there's a little basically rubber duck antenna that's on it right now. Um, you can use honestly any antenna that's tuned to the frequency that you're using. So we'll talk about this more later, but we have the this particular model that we have is the 433 megahertz one. Uh, so any antenna that's tuned for 433 would work. We'll we'll talk a little bit more about this, but we strongly recommend that people add an SMA connector um, to these boards. Uh, they can either run with a um, you can technically just take a a piece of wire um, and solder it onto the board, and that would work too. Um, yeah, and Austin put a link there for one of the antennas that we use. Now, for the ground station side, because we were already using amateur radio APRS, and uh, with that, we already had a huge Yagi antenna on our roof of How Hall that we have. So we already have a large gain. So, so keep in mind, part of the reasons why we've gotten such good performance with these uh, is that uh, we do have a fairly high gain antenna that's on our roof. 
Um, however, having said that, we've also, even with two rubber duck antennas, LoRa's work really, really well, and we've actually been able to pick them up, um, e even going to a not as high gain antenna. Uh, granted, the, the range gets reduced, of course, but um, so yeah. So uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, I mean, Austin posted a link there. There's a few others that you could definitely use. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later as well, too. Um, let's see. Um, yes, the the low raw is. Um, okay, so yes, these are all good, good, good. Uh, uh, so the the low raws first. Let me a answer this question first. The low raws are a two way. Um, so, yes, a lot of the stuff that we're doing right now is one way, but it is a bi directional link that we have. Uh, and we have done that. So, we, we did a flight um, that was working with another set of students uh, that needed to send a command to trigger a motor um, at altitude. And so, we have used these to also trigger commands and, and communicate back and forth with the payload uh, as well. Um, so yeah, it, it does work for that. Again, for this simple demonstration, I'm focusing mostly on just you know using this as a tracker. But you can easily modify the code to be listening for a command and then act on that command as well. Um, yeah. So the Adafruit website, I, I think that all they have is the spring shaped ones. Again, um, for the SMA. Uh, I uh, personally, I would I would probably look at an amateur radio shop um, because it, the 430. Keep in mind, 433 is right in in the amateur radio band, and that kind of goes to Randy's question on is there a limit by the FCC on maximum gain with your Yagi that you can have? And no, because we're doing these under amateur radio. So the difference between the 433 module and the 900 megahertz module is that. Technically, under the 433 module, you should be doing these under your amateur radio call sign. Therefore, you're you're following the rules for uh, amateur radio. Um, so technically, no, um, but uh, or at least not usually anything that you'd probably run into an issue with um, uh, at those frequencies. Uh, so yeah, there. Uh, that's one of the things that we do as well is that we're we're technically running these under uh, M trio. Now, if you use the 900 megahertz modules, which we started playing around with, but then we weren't as happy with the performance compared to the 400 megahertz modules. Um, those are under the ISM band uh, for that. Yeah, and I, I will mention uh, our actual transmit power is very, very low. The really nice thing about these low res is their the error correcting and the uh, the sensitivity of the radio itself is so good that as long as you don't have a very high low noise floor, you can with very little receive power still get um, very good reception. Yep. Yeah, the way that LoRa handles both the uh, the modulation and some of the encoding, um, it's it's very. Um, I don't want. I mean, it has a pretty high noise immunity. Um, so even at the noise floor, you can still decode. We we've, we've decoded down to what Matt like minus 110, 120 dBm. Uh, 120. Yeah, uh, minus 120 yeah. is what we were. Minus getting. 120 dB. Okay. Yeah. So I mean. We we've pulled in signals pretty pretty well. Uh, have I tested other low raw packages that you might recommend? Um, like yeah, I mean like that we we did one flight with the no nine hundred megahertz uh, ones. Um, honestly, all of these are using the RFM uh, either ninety five I think it's either ninety five or the other variants is ninety six chipsets and um, all of those chipsets have excellent performance with them. I don't think we've tested all of those on a high altitude balloon program. I know I've tested some of the low raws on a few other pro projects um, and had had always good results with those. Yeah, we just don't use much in the way of 900 megahertz because I don't know if we're just that noisy around us, but we, we can't get range with 900 megahertz. Right.
Okay. So again, these are all great questions. Um, some of them are a little bit, um, again, we're going to talk now um, with, with some other things. Um, but why don't we go ahead and um, now that I at least got a chance to take a drink here and uh, kind of clear my throat a little bit. All right. So we will. Uh... Okay, so I showed uh, earlier that again, we have um, a fairly extensive library that we can use. So I'm just going to kind of recap this. Uh, again, we can download those uh, libraries uh, as a bundle. And then you can install the ones that you want. And again, I would I would recommend that you grab uh, the ones that you need, so you have plenty of room to work with uh, on there. Having said that, I've definitely installed a fair amount of libraries, and usually it's fine. But you know, uh, I usually just grab what I want. Now, the other thing too, again, if you upgrade your CircuitPython, let's say 6.0 comes out, and you want to move to 6.0, remember you will probably need to also not only download, but probably re-transfer over uh, libraries uh, for 6.0 as well. Um, because again, there could be something that, uh, a feature or something that got added um, in that new version that might break something with an older library. So um, just keep that in mind. Of course, you can always go by the, the old adage of, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Uh, so, I mean, if your code's running just fine in version 5.0, and there's obviously nothing that you need specifically uh, from that, then you could you could do that as well. Um, all right. So the Moo editor uh, this allows us to write code, uh, access the repo, and also access the serial port. Uh, it also has a data plotter, which we'll take a look at here in just a second. Again, I mentioned earlier that technically you can use any text editor. Uh, to access your, uh, you know, write your Python code or your circuit Python code, and mostly it's Python, uh, and then uh, save it. What's nice with the Moo editor, the only thing I would caution you when it comes to that is that you need to make sure the text editor does a proper closing out of the file um, and sort of releases it as well. Um, some text editors aren't very good with that. Um, if it's probably more of a of a you know a text editor like Atom or something that's probably uh, used in a lot of other programming, it's it's probably fine. And you'll actually see I'm I'm going to switch back and forth between Moo and 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 Atom. Um, so the Moo editor, I'll just briefly kind of show you where that is at. So this is where you can download it. So it's code with dot mu. Um, and uh, you can go ahead and download. Now the, the current version right now is version 1.0.3. And uh, they do also have um, some alpha versions that they're testing right now as well. So if you want to, again, if you want to go on bleeding edge, uh, software, you can do that. Otherwise, uh, you can download it. Uh, it can run portable, so it doesn't have to be installed. Otherwise, there's a Windows installer, there's a Mac OS 10 installer um, for that. And there's also a version that will run on a Raspberry Pi for Raspbian uh, as well. Uh, so all you need to do is uh, download it for your appropriate uh, operating system that you're using. And when you have that, uh, you will have something like this. And this is basically the Moo editor that we have right here. Um, what I've done, by the way, uh, they have a couple of different um, themes uh, that you can flash or uh, move between. So I, I tend to like the, uh, the darker themes uh, myself. So you'll notice here again, um, when you run Moo Editor, especially if you have like a feather board or a micro bit board or something that's plugged in, Moo Editor should automatically detect that. And it'll probably ask you, hey, do you want to switch to like CircuitPython mode? 
uh, for that. Uh, and then you just tell it yes, and then you're usually good to go. Uh, and all this is doing is, again, if I, um, if I tell it to open up, so again, um, actually, before I do that, let me do this. So remember, your device mounts like a flash drive. So this is our, this is the Feather M4 board that I have plugged into my system right now. Um, so uh, you can see we have 1.87 megabytes free of 1.97. And that is where our code and everything lives. So when we go over here to Moo, and we, let's say we want to load what's in there now, um, and if I go to code, um, okay, yeah, and I already have it open uh, for that. So with, and this is a good time to also just mention uh, something else with Python as well, especially with CircuitPython. So anytime, so there's, there's only one file, quote unquote, that, that you can sort of run on there. Anything that is named code.py uh, is what will be run. Now, you can have multiple files if you want, um, and you can reference them, you, you can import them uh, like you would anything else with Python. But for these simple examples, we're just gonna put everything into one file. So again, for some of you that might be coming from C, you know, we're used to having like header files and other types of files. Um, Python typically works more with with that file again is kind of developed more of that rapid prototype, but you can have multiple files if you wanted to um, if if you wanted to clean up your code a little bit. Uh, okay. That's the Moo editor. Okay. So here's again where I'm gonna kind of switch back and forth between screens um, because let's go ahead and just take a look. And actually we've already been looking at it a little bit, but let's let's take a little bit more of a closer look at um, you know, looking at a, a sort of more of a of a hello hello world uh, type of uh, program. So here is a uh, the hello world that we have. Um, oh, and before I forget, and I will let's see. Actually, Matt, can you go ahead and um, also post a link to the GitHub repository where we have this code? If you could do that, that would be great. Yeah, so we have a we we put a lot of our code into a GitHub repository. Um, so we will go ahead and put that link into the chat so that people can see that. Um, and uh, that way you don't have to try to scramble to write um, if you're trying to do this um, at home. So this is going to be a very basic, um, typical hello world that we do a lot, of, especially with embedded systems, and that is blinking in LED. Uh, this one I'm also going to have it just print a hello world. Uh, so we import our board. Uh, this gives us access to some of the um, board features, um, especially for accessing our pins. Um, digital I.O. and then time is used for our sleep timer uh, that we have here. We're going to define an LED. Uh, we're going to use digital I.O. to tell it that this LED is connected to pin D13. Um, if that looks kind of familiar, and if that's probably because D13 is oftentimes used for Arduinos, and so it's the same type of um, uh, pin type of setup that they've done for that. Uh, and again, we're going to, we want this to be an output. So we want to set our direction for our digital IO to an output. Uh, in Python, just like any other kind of programming languages, of course, we can have loops. Um, here, we're going to use a very simple um, while loop. 
And by using this while true, uh, what this does is this will cause this um, code block right here to run forever. Uh, we don't, it, it's always going to be true because we've set it to true. So it's never going to exit out of this loop until uh, either we, we hit reset, kill the power, or the end of the world um, comes. Then we are using a true false to basically set the state of our LED. So uh, this will turn it on. We're using a very simple print statement, uh, just a hello world. We're going to sleep. And with the time dot sleep that we have with time, this sleep is in seconds. So we're going to sleep for half a second, turn off the LED, and then sleep for another half a second. Okay. So I have um, the, you should be able to see on uh, the display, uh, I have the um, uh, featherboard M4 that's there. I'm going to go ahead and save this. As soon as I hit save, you're going to notice, and hopefully you can see it. I'll see if I can uh, uh, maybe zoom in a little bit. A little bit closer for that. Uh, so you can see that LED that is by the USB connector that's now flashing. And so that happened as soon as I hit save. As soon as I hit save, the file got saved and updated on the Feather M4. And then the CircuitPython that's running on there immediately just starts executing the code. Uh, and because we're so good, of course, we had no errors. And so it, it, just, it just ran. Um, now, what else can we do or, or, you know, so that that's good. How could we also tell, you know, where's our print hello world? Where did that go to? So if we go to serial here, we can open up the um, serial link that we have between our feather board and between the Moo editor. So this is one reason why using the Moo editor is kind of nice because it has some of these built-in tools uh, for doing that. So even though you can write your code in the text editor, um, you know, you would you might still need to open up like a, a serial program. Um, now, because this is Python, go ahead and hit reset. Oops. All right, well now I'm not getting let me go ahead and put something in here. Let's see. I'll do this. All right, um, so what I've done is I, I purposely put it in an error so I could get into um, the repo. So if I hit any key uh, in here, I can now enter in the repo. So this allows us to actually type in Python commands directly onto the feather board. Um, so it's telling us right now that we're running CircuitPython version 5.3.1 on an Adafruit Feather M4 Express um, with that processor that's on there. I can type in any kind of valid um, Python code. If I want to, for example, just set up um, some uh, variables and uh, let's just do an N plus N, you know, again. So I, I'm actually able to run Python code directly on here. The other thing too, uh, with doing uh, this error that I have, there's there's two things that you'll notice. Um, I'll just whoops. I don't know what I need to do. All right. So first of all, 
you'll notice in the video feed that the NeoPixel is now flashing. And older versions of CircuitPython, that was how you did your debugging. <laughs> uh, you can count the number of flashes, uh, and uh, the color also um, tells you what kind of error that it is. Um, in newer versions now, uh, fortunately, we can. It is also being outputted through the um, serial output as well. So here, oftentimes, this is where you want to have the serial open, uh, and we can see here there's a, a file on code.py on line nine. Digital I/O is not defined. And it's not defined because we we commented out uh, that. Um, if we were to, of course, fix those, then um, we can uh, go ahead and, and and run our code. So. Um, when we're also in uh, the repo, you'll also notice that if. If I go into here, let's say um, I, 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 I'm in here and I'm done with the repo, um, I can hit control D um, and it, it tells you that as well too, you know, use control D to reload um, and then it will exit out of the repo mode and then go ahead and, and try to load whatever you had in your code. Of course, again, right now we have an error, so. So anything that we use with a print statement, if we use print, uh, we can out that will automatically get outputted to the serial. And so we can use that um, not only for debugging, but as you'll see later on, of course, we use that also for um, uh, uh, you can use it. I mean, anything that you would have hooked up to the serial port, whether it's a computer or another device, would would be able to pick that up then. So. Okay, um, let me stop sharing here. Just make sure there is no questions before I move on. I'm trying to save a little bit of time. Um, I don't see anything. All right, I wanna make sure that we get through some of this these topics. So I'm going to go through these next couple of slides um, a little bit quickly. We, we've covered some of this already. So give me a sec. Let me share this again. Okay. Right. So next we want to take a look at, um, so we programmed in the Feather M4. And now let's look at adding a few other devices uh, to that. Um, so the GPS module and the low raw module are the two other devices that we're going to use in this workshop. So just a little bit about the GPS module that we have. So the GPS module is this module right here that's in the middle. And uh, this is uh, Adafruit's um, really good GPS uh, that they have. They, they use these on a couple other, I think they call it the ultimate GPS. Um, this has up to a 10 Hertz update. It is a 66 channel uh, GPS module. It has relatively low current draw, um, about 20 milliamps. Uh, you can see in, in my screen and you can kind of see in the picture there, uh, there is a place for an RTC battery backup so that that can help with reacquiring the signal um, if you lose power. It does support that you can see the uh, patch antenna that's on the top here. Um, and it also supports an external antenna as well. Uh, so there's a small little uh, UFL uh, connector that's on there. Uh, we personally have flown these. Um, they do work above 60,000 feet. Uh, so they, um, they're not like some GPS units that will cut out. Uh, and so we've flown these again up to 110,000 feet uh, without you know, any issues so far. Um, there is one issue that we've had. Um, it hasn't, we, it's, it's not actually with the GPS unit. 
Um, we found that there's a little bit of a bug in Adafruit's GPS library, and we're actually working with, G with uh, Adafruit right now to see if we can get that resolved. Um, it works fine with the Arduino library. This is specific to the CircuitPython library um, with that. Um, if you're wondering if you could um, store data to that two meg of flash, uh, that we have available. So you saw earlier, you know, like we have about 1.8 uh, megabytes right now. Um, yeah, technically you can do it. You have to kind of set the board up into a special mode because it has to lock it away from being accessible from the uh, the USB side of things. Um, there are a couple of risks with it. They, Adafruit does warn you that there is a possibility of corrupting the memory. Um, and of course, it's limited space, so you probably don't want to put a lot of data there. But I have actually used that myself, not for, um, for these, for our balloon flights. Um, I've used it actually for um, egg drop. Uh, and storing accelerometer data. So it does work, um, and you just gotta take some extra precautions. By the way, they do have a tool built into CircuitPython um, that if you do somehow corrupt the memory, the flash memory, they do have a tool that will attempt to do a, a rewipe on it. Um, and oftentimes that will fix um, issues with that. Uh, and then we talked about this earlier, you know, the floating point math, um, because of some limitations with CircuitPython, there is some precision that you lose because we only have about that five or six decimal um, that we can keep track of. Um, I'm gonna skip that for right now. I'll go back to that. I just wanna go ahead and cover these items with the low rod just to make sure that we have that. Um, again, most of this we've covered. So again, we're using the RFM a 95 chipset. We're using the 433 megahertz version. Um, again, we've tested these. Uh, the other thing that I did not mention that we wanted to mention to everyone. So again, we've done a lot of testing with these boards. We've used the wire antenna that you can solder onto it, which eh, doesn't work that great. Um, we also experimented with using a UFL connector. Um, we had a lot of issues with, with using that connector. Uh, we had a lot of signal loss. Uh, what tends to work for us, at least in our testing, um, solder on an SMA connector. Uh, and you can buy an edge mount SMA connector. Uh, Adafruit has those. Uh, and then you can, again, you can plug in uh, either an antenna direct. Of course, you can also use a small SMA cable if you need to extend it, if you want to have it mounted uh, on the outside of your payload uh, as well. Uh, one of the other things that I do want to make sure I point out um, with this as well is that uh, there, there is a little bit of soldering you need to do with these boards. Um, because these boards can be used with um, some other types of, of boards, uh, they have it set up so that you can configure a little bit your uh, chip select and your reset. So. The SPI, the, the master, or uh, it's not master in anymore. Um, the uh, data in, data outlines um, are fixed. Those are the common ones. Uh, but you do need to define your um, chip select uh, and you need to define the, the reset. Now you can also hook up your interrupt pin, but we don't have interrupt in CircuitPython. Uh, so again, if you want to use these with Arduino, you could definitely use the interrupt and then use that pin um, to know that you've got data that you need to, to work with. Um, but in CircuitPython, technically it doesn't need to be hooked up. Um, and I'll show this again, but this is just also showing that again, whatever you hook up for setting what those pins are at, um, then we reconfigure, um, we define those pins in our code. So um, we'll, we'll be using um, D10 and D11 for our chip select and our reset for that. Um, and then the, one of the last things with the design consideration is um, with CircuitPython, we do have a limit to the uh, buffer. Uh, this is, uh, and actually, this isn't just a circuit Python. This is actually due to the hardware. So the radio internal buffer is limited to 252 bytes. 
so keep that in mind. You don't want to send really huge packets, but 252 bytes is usually enough um, for most probably information that you're trying to send. And again, if you needed to send more, you just need to split it up into multiple packets. I've already mentioned the no interrupt support. Um, in CircuitPython, anytime that we do the transmission or receiving, it does block our code from doing other things. So just keep that in mind. Um, generally, it doesn't take the code a lot of time to execute that, but when it is handling that, it can't do anything else. Um, we can do node addressing, uh, but we don't do encryption. That's not supported by CircuitPython. And again, with, if you're finding this under amateur radio, um, the, the encryption is a big another mess uh, as well. Okay. So, first of all, let me uh, stop this so I can see this. And I, I need to set up something anyways. Any questions? Uh, does it have to be reprogrammed for it to be unlocked for error mode, or does it come like that automatically? Um, the error mode is not supported in Circuit Python, right? Or Matt, did you have? Are are we talking for GPS? Well, with the error mode, I think. Yeah, can you clarify that question? Are you talking with the GPS or with the uh, LoRa? Yes, GPS. Oh, okay, never mind. Yeah, go ahead, Matt, if you want to answer that one. Uh, I, I guess I don't know exactly what error mode is. We just use uh, GPGGA. Um, so we're 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 not doing anything special, and it's it's just in GPGGA from the right out of the box. Yeah, I don't think there is on that chip set. Yeah, we've never had a set like an actual error mode. I think I know what you're talking about because the those GPS modules, I think you, know, you can have like a vehicle mode. I think there's an error mode. Um, at least with using the stuff with CircuitPython, we have not had to set that mode. So. Right. Oh, that's that's yeah. No, you don't have to do anything with that. That's yeah. an artificial limit put on by some manufacturers. I don't know why, but yeah, the the Adafruit one does not have that limitation, and there's nothing you have to do to configure it. Okay. Okay. I'm going to. All right, so I'm going to kind of very quickly um, also show some stuff. Uh, we kind of got to answering, I know, a lot of questions, and um, which is good. I mean, I think it's that's great that you guys are asking a lot of questions. Uh, I am trying to be conscious of everyone's time. I don't want to keep everyone much beyond five o'clock since we said five o'clock. I don't have a problem staying a little bit longer, um, and I can always. Uh, answer questions later if we need to. Um, but let me go ahead and um, I will share my screen again just to show a couple other code examples that we have. Um, so I also mentioned with the Moo editor, uh, we can also have a plotter. Um, I'm going to go ahead and save this. So what's happening right now is um, I'm going ahead and I'm actually the there's a, a way to read the temperature of the microcontroller uh, that we have on board, and that's what this is doing. Uh, and there is a plotter here, and let's see if I can make this a little bit larger so it's a little bit easier to read. Maybe. And if I go ahead and kind of put my finger on the, although I'm not sure if I'm affecting it too much, you can see a little bit of an increase. 
So this is just another feature I just wanted to show. This is where, again, the Moo editor is kind of nice because we can also plot some data. So again, this is a nice diagnostic tool. Um, uh, you uh, output your data as a tuple. Uh, and so anyone who's familiar with, with Python should hopefully know what a tuple is. Um, and then uh, it will graph um, whatever data points you have in that tuple. Um, the last thing I'll show um, I won't go into the code details just just because of time, but and again, we'll have these all um, posted for everyone. So again, there is a NeoPixel that is um, uh, online. So if you look at the video feed that I have, you should see the, the NeoPixel. And again, this is a nice RGB LED. Um, and it's basically what it did is it went through and it set uh, the LEDs to fixed colors. Uh, and then when it gets into this while loop, it's just going to go ahead and just kind of rotate through all the different um, rainbows that we have for that. That was just a very quick demo um, on some of the other capabilities that you can do. All right, so let's take a look. And I think, Matt, what I'll do is I'm just going to go ahead and jump right into our tracking code. And then, Matt, I'll probably hand things off to uh, you. OK, so this is the code um, that uh, the students came up with um, using that GPS board and the LoRa board. Uh, so we're using the Adafruit RFM9X. Uh, we're, we just imported some for the, the bus I.O., for the time, the board, and uh, digital I.O. Now, again, we are not using the Adafruit GPS library because we found this error. So we're actually just pulling in the raw string um, coming from the GPS. The advantage with using the Adafruit GPS board is it has some nice features for doing some of the parsing of information for you directly. Um, when we're configuring this, um, again, depending on what kind of board that you're using, um, we're using the 433 board, so we want to make sure that we set our frequency to 433. Uh, we initialize our board, again, based off of what we've defined. So we have our um, uh, chip select um, that's all configured for us. And then we initialize the, the LoRa module. We can set the transmit power. Um, 23 is the maximum. Um, you can reduce that if you needed to for some reason. But of course, for our application, most cases, we want to have that set to our, our maximum uh, power. Uh, we will define here what is our um, RX and TX pins that we're using for the um, GPS, which for us, we so what's nice with using that import board is that we can go ahead and pull in those um, pins directly. We're just using the standard pins for that. And this sets our baud rate uh, and the pins for talking to the GPS module. Um, here we are um, going ahead, and I just realized this has that mistake that we found earlier. Um, we're just reading our, our battery voltage. Um, you can read that from the analog side. This is uh, then taking our uh, feather ID. So I mentioned earlier that we can have an ID. So we put an ID which was defined up here. So our feather ID uh, is defined. And then uh, this will go ahead and take in our message, which will send in our, our GPS string, uh, append the ID, append the, the battery voltage. And of course, if that doesn't work, then it'll let us know that it failed to send um, the message from that. 
and then we are checking in for our GPS data and then outputting our data from there. Okay, so again, we're just taking in our um, GGA strings and basically we're outputting these. And again, I know it's 442. So Matt, do you wanna go ahead and talk about uh, now that you, sh and we were testing this earlier, I imagine Matt, you're you're seeing data? Uh, I, I don't have it pulling data right now. I mean, it takes oh, a okay. few seconds to start it, but okay. I mean, I'll just double check to make sure we're pulling data before. Okay. While he's doing that, I'll make sure that there's no. Um, yep, getting data. Okay, good. So right now, this is transmitting from my home uh, inside my kitchen, actually right now. Uh, and it's being picked up by um our station over in how hall which i would estimate is probably about mm, i think it's well it's about a about a 10 minute drive for me to get to campus so maybe a couple miles should probably have looked that up beforehand but yeah it's probably about two or three miles um so i'm just using this rubber duck antenna of course this has the yagi and it's pointed towards my house um uh, for that and and they're able to pull in these packets um matt are you ready to kind of walk through some of the stuff that uh with the tracking side yeah yeah i can do that uh if you uh want to enable share um yeah let me stop sharing on my end and There we it, go. There you go. Uh, let's see if I can figure out which uh, I want to actually bring up. <laughs> um, there we go. Alrighty. Can you see the PowerPoint? Yes. Still can? Yep. Okay. Um, so once we have this data and we're able to send it and receive it, um, the, the real question is what do we actually do with this data? Um, I know in the past we've done things as simple as just saving it to a text file as it's coming in for like our APRS data. Um, you can do things like using SQLite, which is built into Python. Uh, we, we've kind of taken that to another level and decided to develop a web platform that allows us to save all this data and access all this data without having the risks involved with, you know, misplacing a text file, for instance. Um, so our system is, this whole thing is going to be about Python today. <laughs> um, so we have a two-part system. So we have interface uh, scripts that actually talk with the LoRa's, and then we have a web-based application that we call Sidetrack. Um, so when we connect to the radios, we're, radios, we're just using Python scripts. They read the serial off of the LoRa, so it doesn't have to be Python. This is, uh, the whole system doesn't care about this interface layer, um, which is what's really nice. Uh, you could use, APRS to pull data and send it to the, the, the web application. You could use LoRa, you could uh, manually send data if you want to. Uh, and then it just does a HTML post to Sidetrack through our REST API. Um, so what does Sidetrack actually do? So right now built into Sidetrack is uh, prediction. So we have prediction software that's built into it. Uh, tracking, uh, so we have 3D tracking uh, and 3D prediction, I should say. They're both running off of cesium.js, which is a, a really nice 3D uh, mapping application that's pretty uh, drop-in. Uh, it does all of our data handling and storage. So the, whenever we, for instance, we've got a, a rotor pointer on top of the roof, 
for the longest time, we manually pointed that rotor where we wanted to. The nice thing about this is we've got a interface script between our rotor pointer that talks to our, our web application and actually will pull the current location, do all the calculations and figure out where it needs to point the rotor. Um, and then it does data storage. So not only does it store the, uh, the data for uh, position data, but it'll also store temperature data. It'll, it'll store any data. It doesn't care what you're sending to it. It can take anything that's text-based currently. Um, there is opportunities to do file-based storage also. Um, again, we're built, we built Sidetrack off of the Django backend. And if you've done anything with Django, it's, uh, it runs a lot of the internet. Um, and it's a great and easy backend written in Python, and it allows you to do really adaptive systems. All the data, so when you send data and you receive data, it's all through a REST API, so you don't have to do anything, and it's all in JSON. So it's really easy to use in Python because uh, when you dump a JSON in Python, it actually just becomes a Python data dictionary. So it's super easy to utilize. Oh, oh wrong button. Next. Um, so how do you actually send data? So one of the things that I've always, or the, the biggest pain that I've always found when using other systems is they don't think about um, ease of sending data for um, somebody. So I wanted this system to be as easy to send data to so that if somebody was like, oh, I want to use this system, but I'm not very good at programming and I don't know the proper way of doing everything, I wanted something that would be easily explainable. So there's a two-step process to this. You create a payload and it's just a Python dictionary. Um, it's uh, really easy to do. Um, there's a couple required fields. Uh, in this one, um, uh, the required fields in this one is a script ID. So this is your interface layer ID. So like for instance, let's say you're running a 433 megahertz LoRa and you're running a 900 megahertz LoRa and you're running APRS and you want to send all that data in. Well, if you didn't have some way to differentiate where the data is coming from, it, you could have a really interesting looking path being displayed because you could have data that's coming in that's older than data that you've already put in there. So by having the script ID, you can actually show a specific flight path or a specific data source for that flight path. Then you have your flight ID. Uh, flight ID is what, you know, it's a flight ID. <laughs> it's uh, so both the script ID and the flight ID are UUIDs. Um, it's nearly impossible to get two um, UUIDs that are the same. Uh, so it's it's really easy to implement. You don't really have to worry about that. And these values are actually given to you by the REST API. So you call up the REST API and you request a flight ID and you request a script ID. Uh, you give your current time. Uh, your latitude, your longitude, your altitude, um, and then RSSI is not a required field. We just like having that so we can kind of keep track of, all right, when we got this value in, this was the RSSI that we got. And RSSI, for those that don't know, is a, is a received power indicator. So once we have this payload, how do we actually send it? Again, with Python, it's insanely easy. Um, all we have to do is we use a Python module called requests, and then we do requests.post, the URL that we're sending it to. So um, right now for us, it's sidetracking.com, and then there's a, a REST API that you have to navigate to. I believe it's slash REST slash V1 slash submit data or something like that, or send data. I don't know it off the top of my head. It's just in all my scripts already. The data, so this um, uh, this payload that you created, and then you just have a timeout. That's all you have to do. And it'll send you a 200 received OK if everything's good, and it'll send you errors back if you're like trying to submit it to a, a flight that doesn't exist. So two lines uh, is all you have to add to any of your code in order to interface with Sidetrack, which makes it really easy if you're already using something, like if you're already sending your data to um, like APRS.fi, um, two lines, and you can have that also sent to Sidetrack. So let's go take a look at what this actually entails. And this is going to be me having to switch scenes. Um, I'm also 
Okay, so <clears throat> this is uh, Sidetrack. Um, actually, let's let's step back for a second and actually take a look at those interface files. So I need to change what I'm sharing. If I can figure that out. It's probably in towards the top, Matt. There no, you go. it is. It's just not as useful. Remote desktop. <laughs> we'll share the remote desktop. All righty. So in in here is where we've got um, a lot of our uh, our stuff that's going. Actually, no, this is the wrong screen. I am I'm all over the place. I need to. There it is. That's what I wanted to share. Um, okay, so in here, so these are the, the just to kind of go through, can you guys see um, a text editor right now? Or Matt, can you? Um, you might want to see if you can blow it up a little bit, Matt. At least on mine, it's a little small to read. Um, how's that? Is that better? That's better. Okay, so in here, this is how we actually request a flight. So a flight into data script. So in here we do a request.post and this should actually be, let me fix that. There. So we do a, a post request to the REST API. And from that, we get a, a JSON text file, a text string back. Um, so all we're doing is request.post in that post, our payload is just a, a request to a, a directory. Uh, and then that gives us a response. And that's what this R is. That response, we then get, uh, we actually get some meaningful stuff out of that by doing json.loads r.text. So that gives us the, the text of the response and that gives us the JSON data. Now, nice thing about this, this JSON data is now just a Python dictionary. In this Python dictionary, there's two things. There's a flight ID and a script ID for uh, the flight. Um, you don't have to use the script ID. Um, eventually, that's going to be changed. And then you get out of that your flight ID and your script ID. So what do we do with that? Um, so with that, we go into our send data script. So this is a script that we have written that um, does a couple things. Uh, first thing we've got in our main loop, we have our flight ID and our script ID. These are both UUIDs. And then these post to um, the, uh, the REST API. Uh, so it's got a two things that we're actually posting to. The first one is the uh, actual flight location. And the other one is flight data raw. So that's the raw data that we're actually uh, getting in. So that includes our GPS data, that includes whatever data that you're wanting to send down. So anything that's not GPS data that you're wanting to store, you just send to this flight data raw um, URL through the REST API. Uh, we connect to our LoRa. From there, uh, things get a little bit interesting. But all we're doing in here is essentially looking to see if there is a GPA GG, GPGGA string in there, and from there, we're pulling it out. Uh, we're getting our lat long or altitude. And then this is where we create that um, that parameter in the in the the actual send the data in. And then there's some error handling and, and stuff like that in there. Nice thing is, is we also wanted to have our APRS data show up on there. So I did write this uh, little script um, one day. And all this does is it actually pulls from APRS.fi. You have to get your own uh, um, uh, API key. But what it'll do is it'll actually pull down a flight ID. So this is whatever your call sign is. It'll pull that data down, uh, get lat long altitude, and it'll actually send it to the um, to sidetrack. So if you're wanting to mess around with it and you want to still use APRS.fi um, or whatever you're currently using, you can kind of just grab this script and also have it send off to um, Sidetrack without having to worry about messing up any of your current operations. Um, and then if we want to pull data down from the, the REST API, how do we do that? 
So uh, the nice thing about the way uh, the REST API works is we can pull down just the flight position of, um, of whatever flight we're doing. So we have a, a rotor pointer on the roof. And so we've got, this is the actual control software for it, but we can pull down right here. We're pulling down the latest location data that we have. So we can just keep pulling this data down constantly while uh, we're flying and it, call, it, it keeps the rotor pointed directly where we want the entire time. Uh, this is just some really complicated math actually based off your latitude and longitude and your payloads light and longitude where you actually need to point. Don't try figuring it out, just copy and paste that. It's, it's not worth trying to figure out. Um, and then uh, it'll just set the azimuth and elevation of our rotor. So a really easy way to just grab uh, information in Python or whatever you want to use. Uh, if you really want to be a masochist, you could write this in C. So what is, uh, okay, it's easier for me to just stop sharing and, re and share. Uh, so what does all this actually look like? So what is the actual process in here? So <clears throat> in here, we've got uh, a couple things. Let's, let's do start by making a new flight. And you could actually integrate all this into, uh, it looks like you can't actually make that larger. You can actually incorporate all this into the same script if you really want. Um, I kind of keep it separate because I don't need to accidentally make like 50 flights. So we call uh, get new flight response 200 okay. So now we have a new flight ID. So all you have to do is copy that. And we're gonna go to send data. So in send data, we have this flight ID. All we have to do is replace it. And now we're set up for a new flight. That's it. That's all you have to do to set up for a new flight. Now, when you run uh, this script, it's going to send the data to a brand new flight object, and you don't have to worry about anything else. There's no other configuration that you have to do. Uh, we are working on adding some new features for like team management so that you can do things like uh, checklist built into the system and like have status boards in order to keep track of those. But if you just want to track a flight, all you have to do is get a new flight ID and plop it into uh, this tracking script for LoRa. So now we're going to uh, go ahead and start sending this data. So, oh, there we go. Start sending the data. Pulls in right away. It starts pulling in our GPS and I, I it spits out a lot of output. You don't have to, you can get rid of a lot of that if you want to. I like having it there just so I can keep an eye on it on the side, even while um, uh, running the actual tracking software. Um, from there, it looks like it closed. Uh, we can actually go to, um, and I have to go to a different URL that I had to forward it to because the university decided that they wanted to uh, um, block my my domain name. <clears throat> so now we're in sidetrack and you can take that. So once we're in sidetrack, um, we'll let it load up here. Um, you can see that it'll actually bring up all the, the recent flights, which all happen to be over Matt's house right now. Um, you will eventually be able to click and then just view the flight. Um, however, that's kind of broken at the moment, uh, so I, I got to get around to fixing that. But you can just drop. So to actually view a flight, it's just the domain, sidetrack, and then whatever the UUID is for that flight ID. So it keeps that flight ID constant throughout the entire thing. So now we can go and take a look at that. Let it load. It takes a second. Doesn't help I'm VPN'd in. Um, so this is uh, Sidetrack. It's a fully uh, 3D environment that allows you to pan, zoom, tilt, um, 
and it's actually been incredibly useful for us. I was hoping to have a uh, a, a one of the really cool examples, uh, which was we had a flight that um, we had a flight that actually went and landed um, in the water, but we we so we lost tracking on it. And when we showed up, we took a look at sidetrack, and we were actually able to see the line of it going directly into the water, which was really cool and really unfortunate at the same time. So to kind of see what an actual, oh, to, uh, you're going to have to switch again, aren't I? Uh, one second. Remote desktop and the, I'm not used to using Cisco, so it takes me a second to do some of these things. All right. That should be right. All right. Um, so this is one of the really cool things that you can do with Sidetrack is you can actually, oh, um, you can see uh, profile views of your flight as it's happening. Uh, it does automatically update as data gets sent in. Uh, it updates once every eight-ish seconds uh, just to kind of keep the server load down. Um, but nice thing about this is you can actually switch between different maps. So if you want to take a look at um, at street maps, you can take a look at street maps and see, oh, okay, that's exactly where it fell. Now, how high above the ground were we when we actually uh, when we got that last packet? So you can actually kind of extrapolate in in 3D with this to kind of figure out and give a better approximation than if you were just in 2D. So if you're just in 2D, you're going to lose out on some of that because you don't really know how high above ground it is. Um, the, the ground here is close to what ground actually is. It's not perfect. Um, I think there's one or 200 feet difference um, from what we've seen. Uh, but it's super useful to just be able to look at that as we're going. And you can also look at different data sources too to see, like if you lose tracking on one of your data sources, you can actually look at a different data source in order to see uh, where that actually is. And tomorrow for the flight, we'll actually have live tracking up. So if you're wanting to see and actually feel and kind of get a feel for how this works when you're actually tracking a balloon, we will have this uh, running tomorrow and I'll be able to send a link out to that. Um, other than that, uh, if you want to get data from it, I'm hoping I'm still short. Should, am, do you see, uh, um, the, this data now? Yeah. Uh, it's, it, again, it's a little small map. Yeah. But so all, all this is right here. Um, this is our flight data. So if you want just, um, uh, the packets, the altitude, the lat long altitude packets, um, you can pull those directly. Uh, from the REST API. And then let's say you've got a bunch of other data. Um, there is a data array that you can pull down. And all this is just in native JSON. So it's really easy to manipulate in Python. And I can, I can send out some links for you guys to take a look at how this works uh, later, just so that you can kind of get a feel for how the system works. Uh, there's a lot of updates that are going to be happening to it uh, once I get time. <laughs> Um, does anybody have any questions on the system? Um, so, Matt, um, we had uh, one, one question which I answered in the Q&A, uh, but I'll go ahead and answer uh, again. And that is, um, we had one person that asked, you know, if the uh, files that we have would be open source um, and if we could share that. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, again, we'll share links to the, the repos that we're using for these. We'll share links to what we have uh, for these files. Um, we do open source um, the, the code that we have, so we will share those. And then, Matt, this is definitely a question for you because I'm not 100% sure. I think I know what the answer is, but uh, there's also a question on what is the 3D app that you use in Sidetrack um, for that? Uh, so 
this is cesium.js. It's uh, like you can do everything from uh, showing satellite orbits in outer space to um, like doing buildings, and it's extremely powerful and it's extremely resource intensive. So like uh, Sidetrack, you can is actually mobile friendly for the most part, um, and it's touch friendly, which is pretty nice. So you can actually just pull it up on your phone. Um, but it is pretty pretty intensive when it comes to resources, so don't expect your battery life to be good. Uh, we wrote our own predictor. Uh, yeah. So there's there's some features that we we've that we have added and will be adding to our prediction software, like the ability to um, uh, and and this kind of all ties into how we want to do the, the integration of Sidetrack. So the end game with Sidetrack is to have a, a system that you can log into as a team that can handle any of your, uh, your checklists that you have to do. It can give you a uh, status board on those checklists if you want to use checklists. Um, you can uh, save data by flights. Uh, you can have flight groupings. So like if you're going to do a bunch of flights with the same hardware or the same goal, like for instance, uh, solar eclipse, you can keep all that data into a centralized location instead of having to be like, all right, what flight ID was that and go back. But that also ties into when you're doing, if you set up a flight ahead of time, be like, all right, these are the parameters of the flight. This is the uh, parachute we're using. This is the size of the balloon, all that stuff. When you actually go to do the flight tracking, it can do um, prediction based off the parameters you gave it. The issue that I've always had with HabHub is it, it makes assumptions about what you're using. So like it doesn't know where it's going to land until it starts to fall because it doesn't know the characteristics of what you're doing. With our system, we can constantly uh, we can keep the values that you've already input for uh, the prediction, so that during your tracking, it can actually update your your prediction as you're flying. So it gives you a, a better idea earlier. Um, and another thing that um, I've got added in, but it hasn't been committed, is um, the ability to keep updating your um, uh, keep updating your uh, uh, winds aloft data as you fly. Again, since we're covering such a wide area when we're flying, keeping the same data set from the beginning and not updating your data as you're uh, going along is going to lead to inaccuracies in the system. Yep. Um, another question that we had asked, uh, so so yeah, just to kind of, first of all, piggyback on what Matt said. Um, yeah, so Iowa State's been working on um, flight prediction for probably the last 15 years now. And so we've had several students, even some students that have done it as part of their master's program. Uh, that have worked on the flight prediction algorithm. And so we've, we just kind of use what we've developed over the years for that. But again, um, we'll have that um, open source. Uh, the other question uh, that Bill Brown had asked was, uh, are there enough low RAN, low raw WAN ground stations in the US to make that usable for HAB? Um, not that we are aware of. Uh, a, again, if if this is a typical flight, so the typical flights that we've flown are a flight of burst. Um, so we're typically flight times of maybe anywhere between two and a half to maybe three and a half hours max. Uh, we do our prediction. We don't typically try to go too far, but again, we've done these flights, especially within the state of Iowa. And it, we typically will pull in packets, again, pretty close to ground before we lose them at our ground station at Howe Hall. Now, in addition, our, our operational procedures is that we send students out via vehicle to, to chase after it as well, too. And they also have, so we actually have a handheld version um, of, of this kind of setup with the GPS, with the low raw, uh, that also has a o OLED display on it so that the students can also see on a portable, a handheld version, exactly how far away the, the payload is. And as long as they're picking up that, they're close enough to pick up that low raw signal, then they're fine. 
We do sometimes, although not as much recently, sometimes we may fly a backup APRS um, transmitter. Uh, we, we stopped doing that. Oh, yeah. Because of the, it was uh, interfering. <laughs> yeah, it, it was blowing out the lower and causing it to fault. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, the really nice thing about that handheld, and that that source code is also up there. That's just in a different uh, database. It's all um, it's all Adafruit hardware, so it's a LoRa. So the the old so Bill just asked about the OLED display, and it's a OLED display. Uh, it's a Feather OLED display, so it actually just stacks right onto the stack that he's got up on that he's sharing right now, and so it's literally that with an OLED on top of it. And it gives you bearing and distance. Oh, um, Jesus just asked, can you explain that, Matt, the APRS LoRa issue? So, uh, yeah, um, the Open Tracker and what which radio are we using? That was Midland, right? Yeah, I think open that was, and, was definitely the Midland. Yeah, yeah, the the Midland that we were using when it was putting out APRS, I think it was putting it out at like a watt or two. And uh, these uh, LoRa's are are talking about like 100 milliwatts. So we found that whenever, um, and it wasn't always the first packet, but within the first couple of packets that the Midland put out at that power was actually shutting down and faulting out. Uh, it was an unrecoverable fault for the, the LoRa in the, um, the system. And we found this on C and on, so writing it in C and writing it in, um, uh, circuit Python. So it wasn't just a circuit Python issue. Like, again, just outputting that much power next to something as sensitive as the LoRa, it, it just didn't handle it. Um, I'm pretty sure that's the same. And again, we'll, we'll try to um, post a link, but that should be the OLED display that, that we use. I just put it up in the um, my video feed. So Yeah, and yeah. like with that handheld, like we used to have to use like directional antennas out in the field to try and find it using APRS. And we've gotten to the point at which we'd literally show up where it is, uh, like, cause on its way down, typically our recovery team will pick it up on the handheld. And as long as it has a packet, it'll walk you to within 20 feet of your payload. Cause it gives you bearing altitude and distance. So it, it's really, really nice to use and we have, we don't have any issues finding it as long as we pick up a packet. Yep. So it is 514. Um, I, there's, there's just one last uh, thing that I just wanted to talk about real quick and then we'll, we'll go back. And, and again, uh, we're fine sticking around a little bit if you guys want to for any Q&A. Um, Matt, I'm going to switch myself over to presenter and share my screen. Okay. So, um, the, the last thing that I just wanted to talk about and just kind of wrap things up. So again, we kind of went through in this workshop. Um, I, and I know we kind of had to speed things up towards the end because I didn't realize we were starting to run out of time already. Uh, but hopefully this kind of gives everyone both some ideas and a little bit of what you can do. The really nice thing for CircuitPython is that for some students, uh, especially if they're not a computer science or computer engineering major, um, Python tends to be a little bit more friendlier uh, for them. And so, you know, again, this shows that you can have students work on a project, be able to access stuff um, and use something like CircuitPython and, and make a working tracking system uh, with that. And, and again, both, um, it, it, although Pleva's got years of, of, of programming experience, uh, we've had other students in our high altitude balloon program that probably have not programmed nearly as much and still been able to write some of the code um, that we've used now in, in some of the uh, tracking system. Uh, again, there's lots of different ways that you could expand on this. There's more sensors. Uh, I put in here, there's one feather board that has a thermal infrared sensor on it. That's kind of a cool um, little sensor. There's some other sensors. You can definitely make your own. Again, 
what's nice is that we have access to I squared C spy and serial. Um, and so you could definitely sort of create your own uh, type of system uh, from here. Uh, the last thing I'll mention as well too, um, we haven't flown these much, but we're actually looking at expanding uh, and doing some more work with these. And that is with the um, uh, Adafruit Clue boards and also the, the uh, BBC's Microbit boards. Uh, both of those can also support Python or CircuitPython. What's also nice is they do actually have some decent sensors on them. They have an accelerometer, they have a temp, uh, pressure, and humidity, if I remember right. Um, and we're actually looking at it, expanding a little bit more and including some of those boards and then, and then tying that into our low raw system from there. So, um, uh, yeah, and then, uh, again, uh, just one of the last things with the low raw, uh, again, it does support addressing, um, we've used this to support multiple devices in the payload. Um, we're currently doing some experimenting also with mesh networking, um, with low raw as well. Um, so that kind of wraps up at least all the major things. Again, if you need to go, that's fine. We totally understand. Sorry, we kind of went a little long, um, but we'll definitely uh, look at some questions. Um, so if you have any questions, uh, tell you what, um, we'll, yeah, just if you, if you guys want to ask. Um, so what down, Bill Brown asked, what downrange distance have you experienced for LoRa? So downrange distance, uh, and Matt, you can help me out with that. I think, again, we've gone um, probably at least 100 I, miles or so. Yeah, the one that I can absolutely prove because I, I, I am on a different database right now was 70 miles, where the okay. worst um, RSSI was 91. <laughs> so yeah. Um, I, I at one point I did a link budget and I I found about 150 miles. Yep. Now again, once we kind of go over that curvature of the Earth, you know, this is UHF frequency, so you know, this is while we're in the air, yeah, we we get pretty good stuff. But then once it goes over that, then the ground station will will lose it. But yeah, got some pretty good range with these. Any other questions? If there's not, uh, again, thank you all for coming. Um, really do uh, appreciate everyone being able to uh, come to this. Uh, again, we'll we'll kind of go from there. Um, oh, we got one more question. Uh, uh, so the other question was, uh, what solution did you implement with the APRS low raw issue? Uh, the solution was not via APRS. <laughs> uh, that, that was the solution that we came up with. Uh, we, we didn't try to like notch filter it or, or anything like that. Um, honestly, what happened was the main reason why we were flying APRS was we were using it as a backup. Uh, especially when we were in the testing phases um, for the lower radios. So we tend to test a lot of our hardware before we kind of certify it to be, all right, this is what we're going to stick with. Um, by that time, we had done, I think, at least four or five different flights with the LoRa. Now, we did have some issues at the beginning. It turns out most of those turned out to be software issues not necessarily issues uh, with the system. And then the one case where we were having problems picking it up, we found out that the issue was with that connector and we just weren't getting a good reading uh, from the system. Once we swapped out to a more reliable SMA connector, uh, then we've had really good luck, you know, with, with all of these and, and getting uh, excellent range from them. So. Yeah, uh, and one, of, one of the side benefits of this is we were able to cut out pounds of payload mass yes. by switching to these low rest systems because it's a it's a 2000 milli, uh, milliamp hour uh, 3.7 uh, volt lipo which weighs practically nothing and then these low row boards are practically nothing too compared to we used to have a uh, a three cell like 5000 or 
two or or three thousand, two or three thousand milliamp hour uh, lipo that was just a behemoth. So by switching away from that, not having to have a heavy metal encased radio, um, the we were able to reduce the the overall weight a lot, and we we're and we we're able to add functionality by using um, this lower because we can send data over it instead of just APRS data going over the system. Yep. Um, Bill Brown, uh, well, first of all, uh, Jesus, yes, uh, absolutely. Um, I'll, uh, I, you'll probably see me at the conference as well, too. If you want to keep in touch with us, that's uh, totally fine. Um, uh, I will see if I can send you an email. And so you have my contact information. Um, Bill Brown asked about the uh, little wheel, the halo style antennas um, or the cloverleaf antennas. Uh, yes, we have flown those antennas. Uh, we've flown those uh, when we were doing some testing with the 900 megahertz. Uh, we actually did not have good luck with those. Um, I don't know if it was just because of something else that was going on with them, uh, but we eventually abandoned those um, and we just decided to go back to the, the rubber ducks. Um, Matt, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's what I'm seeming to remember when we did those. I think we still use the wheel though for 900 because we still fly 900, but it's primarily yeah. just as a secondary for the handhelds. Oh yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, if I remember right, I don't think Matt, we were getting as good of readings and that could be for other reasons too. So. Yeah, no, there's, we were, right. I don't know. We've just never had luck with the 900 megahertz spectrum. It, because we've tried the the RFMs and or uh, the uh, RFD 900s, and we didn't have much luck with those, um, even with pretty good Yagi's on the roof. Right, right. And yes, uh, Bill, you're right. You know, of course, using the wheel eliminates that null beneath the payload um, with the vertical antenna. Um, we we kind of anticipate that um, when we're when we set up our payloads and everything. So we know we're going to have that null. Um, so it, it hasn't been a huge problem for us, but yeah, you're right. That's the advantage with using that wheel. So. Yeah, and we, we're, we're not really underneath the payload very much. Our, our elevation angle is typically like 20 to 30 degrees, so. Right. Now, having said that, we, we have been thinking about experimenting with other types of antennas as well, too. So I have a feeling we'll continue to experiment, but um, yeah, it's just uh, for right now, we had those vertical rubber ducks and they were they were doing the job. And again, part of it is we have such a you know high gain on the roof. So I think it's 13. I think we have a 13. I think it's 13 or 14. Yeah. So. But yeah, even with the handheld with just a rubber duck on the 433, a lot of times um, the recovery team is able to get it until it hits like 70,000 feet, so. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Um, not seeing any. Again, uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. I will. I will stay on a little bit um, longer if anyone wants to. But I think we'll officially kind of close out the workshop. Again, thank you all for for coming, and uh, I hope to see at least most of you virtually tomorrow for the conference. So with that, see ya.